get, we might get better at that over the course of this year. That's interesting. Um, I, you know, it all goes just generally though, I've been writing about player development more because of a trip I made to driveline in, I don't know, like 2014 or something. Um, and, uh, one thing that really clicked for me, that was really cool for me was there's like a fair amount of like evaluation, evaluation work and it's cool. Um, and it, it, even to be a better at player development, you have to be really good at evaluating players. Um, because you need to know what is good and like, what are we aiming for? Um, but, um, at the same time, like the, when I got there, I was like, oh yeah, all this stuff that we've learned can be used to make players better. And that was just that along with going more into the clubhouse and talking to players, I was like, oh my God, these guys are really smart and they have really good questions. And they, the questions they have, plus the, you know, kind of a bit data abilities that we have, we could do something really cool where, we, you know, if you combine the player experience with uh, the sort of data and tech uh, experience, I think you can go further. So, yeah, because yeah, it's, it, it's kind of like a derivative of evaluation and scouting, right? Like mm -hmm. using it to, to track uh, progress over time instead of just like uh, at one time point at the entrance, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of being like, I don't like transaction analysis, it's okay. But like, first of all, you're going to look dumb a lot <laughs> and you're gonna be like, oh, this trade was great for this team or whatever. And then there's going to be a lot of like, well, it was great for both sides, uh, you know, <laughs> and then there's also like you've just been traded and, you know, like pundit X has come out and said you were like a terrible return yeah. or, you yeah. know, you're you're a terrible prospect. Like a lot of that stuff uh, kind of leaves me cold a little bit. So it's, it's um, exciting to kind of reframe things and be like, you know, stuff is really cool. I use stuff and an evaluative thing. I use it as the underpinning of, of pitching rankings, a, a number that changes velocity and movement into outcomes, you know, stuff relates to it. Um, but like y'all can use it to see how much better like a pitcher stuff is getting when you're working with them, you know? Yeah, right. So I, and I and that's actually one of the main things we do with it. We, we track, um, we track kind of like session to session, how much a pitcher mm -hmm. improves in pitch design based on like where they came in. We do like a baseline session. Then we have PD trainers work with them and track stuff over like multiple sessions and see if it's like training in the right, right direction. Uh, I was going to say one quick thing on something you said that I've always I've always been impressed how good of relationships you seem to have with with the players you write about and the teams you write about. Is that is that easy to or like how how's that go? Because I know. Obviously, at a certain point, you have to like compare players, have to compare teams. Um, I know you just mentioned you kind of like lay off that, but is that is that something that comes naturally to you, naturally to you, or do you you kind of consciously find yourself thinking about ways to keep those relationships good and keep getting like really good interview answers and having really good conversations? Well, it's a it's a tough question to answer right now after a year of not <laughs> seeing him. Um, yeah. I I had to work my Rolodex pretty hard this year. And uh, I hope there's actually one piece in particular that uh, I hope didn't uh, didn't ruin my reputation in the clubhouse. I did write about um, the pine tar and uh, how much it um, how much it can change your stuff and how much it can it can mean uh, for a pitcher and how how almost everybody's using it. And uh, that one in particular, I've been sitting on for like four or five years. And uh, it, I thought I thought I could just get to the point where, uh, you know, like I think Trevor Bauer would even agree. Like he's he's kind of been like talking about it and been trying to like tell everybody about it, you know, in in different ways. And I think it got to the point where it's like, okay, everyone's frigging doing it. You know? yeah. So um, yeah. I thought I had to write about it. It was kind of it, it's one of those things that could explode into like a bigger deal, um, you know, if if it if 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 the wrong things happen, you know? Right. So anyway, I thought, um, I thought I would write about that. And I, I definitely had players that told me before I wrote that, that I shouldn't write that. Oh, wow. So, uh, one of them still texted me, uh, afterwards. We just didn't talk about the piece. So I don't know if he didn't read it or <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow. uh, like, we'll, we'll see, but they, they were, I mean, the pitchers, they were pitchers, the pitchers, yeah. they were telling me, uh, don't do that because, um, Manfred will just turn it into like another, uh, you know, another thing where he's got a, like a, another witch hunt basically. And he'll try to like, you know, over legislate and he'll change some rules and it'll just get terrible. Um, and um, I guess I, I can see that perspective. And that's why I argued 
basically they should come up with some sort of approved gunk. I like in softball they have that, right? Like softball yeah. pretty much has like oh, a, do they? Yeah, they have like a gor- gorilla it's not gorilla glue, but it's golden gorilla or something. They have mm. some approved substance that, yeah. in like that in like the higher levels of softball that they're just allowed okay. to use. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they have it on the hitting side. Like, the like pine tar is fine as long as it's like an approved thing. So, but have you guys ever like? There's no link between pine tar and the hitting side and like better outcomes. I mean, there. whoa! You hit <laughs> like with you back. hit with slippery hands. That's tough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's not like it increases your spin rate or like you know. If I'm losing like the bat, extra, I can't make you, contact. You an extra half ticket EV if you just put pine tar on there. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely some rumors or some people like have theories about uh, putting sticky substances on the barrel. Yeah, uh, for that reason, and that'd be fun Which to, is a rule fun to test out and see if there's anything high. to that. I can't. I, uh, the physics of it, I don't. I don't get it. Like, I don't. I don't get why it would help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure either. I, I was gonna ask uh, on pieces like that that are a little bit more edgy, a little bit more like risky as far as uh, like rubbing players or whoever, whoever of your audience the wrong way. Are those? If it's an edgy topic, are those more fun to write, or do you have like a favorite type of story that you like to write? Um, or even a, a favorite story in particular. I don't know, man. It gives me it gives me heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, oh man, is this player gonna be mad at me when I put publish this? Um, you know, and uh, th- it's fine. But you know, like we did a thing where we we made Code Breaker the, the 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 like algorithm that Houston had, and then we trained it. We actually got. Um, this was really hard to to run down. We actually got video from behind uh, center field, like of the catcher's crotch, basically, you know, un, like unchanged, unedited, you know, because mm-hmm. like when you look back at like World Series footage, they, they don't show the signs, wow. you know, most of the time. So we actually got like just that camera um, and we then we went and talked to Max Scherzer about like, like here, we broke your signs here. You know, what, like, is that earlier than you thought or did you know? And he's like, no, I knew. And uh, we changed the signs in the next, like here, you know, and we had him run through it. And uh, because he took part in it, I felt like, okay, we're like, this will be fine. But that, that was really fun because we had, you know, an algorithm that we produced that people could download and play with. Um, We had like, I had NASA codes in there. Um, My friend, Andrew Perpetua gave me NASA codes that he thought were like unbeatable, but it required the pitcher to learn 12 pages of codes. Oh my God. <laughs> I was just like, uh, I don't know, man. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> um, and so we just had like all these, that's my favorite. It's like when, when like I did this one piece that like, I always think of that uh, players over time, actually they they get less volatile. Mm -hmm. So their peaks, of course, their valleys, you'd think their valleys would go down, but their, their peaks and valleys, their valleys come up and their peaks go down. And so instead of being like a teenager, you know, when you're like a 32 year old baseball player, you're more like this. And, um, I'm a psych major. So we, I had, there was like, there's absolutely that in, in happiness research where people learn like, oh, I feel bad. I'm going to eat a tub of ice cream. I'm going to go on a run. I'm going to go play with my dog. I'm going to, you know, yeah. like they, we had these things called coping mechanisms and people kind of make fun of them, but they work. You know, yeah. there are times where you're like, I feel terrible. Now I just had a jog. Now I'm, I'm good. You know, so like um, I think that baseball players have that too, where they're like, okay, I'm going to do video today. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm mm. going to get in there. I'm going to do, you know, this drill or that drill. And like these drills kind of keep people you know, better doing better. So, and that one was really great because I had Bill Petty, Bill Petty's volatility research. He did an aging curve for me where volatility just goes down. Yeah. Oh, that's um, cool. I got my psych research in there. That's sick. Yeah. So I was going to say one, one kind of interesting question. I think, uh, I don't know. I don't think a lot of people will talk about this, but do you think, do you think the Astros cheating scandal was actually, there's a chance it could have been, it could be better for baseball long-term in terms of, driving interest and letting people know about like to the the extent to which like players and teams are trying to improve. Like, do you think, do you think that's because, because most people, most people see it as like a negative mark. Right. And then there's the asterisk store, all this stuff. The asterisk got a bunch of haters, but do you think there's anything to be said for the idea of 
it being like a very, very national story and also just raising awareness to what teams and players can do with video, algorithms, coding, uh, just creative ways to improve. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to tell what the world thinks. You know, sometimes you're in Twitter and you're like, well, not on Twitter. They're all mad. Uh, but being mad, I think I would say that the value comes from people being mad. I think uh, having a heel is good. Um, and, uh, you know, the Yankees are kind of a built in heel uh, in terms of just like spending a lot and winning a lot. Um, but, um, here we have a team that, um, really pushed the limits, I think. And, uh, I think it's okay to have heels. I, I think that, you know, in the coverage, you know, Car- you know, Carlos Correa's on field interview, um, uh, one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen, you know? And, uh, and so you get, you add that all up and, uh, the one reason I hesitate to say it was totally good is that like, there is a definitely a group of fandom that does not want to hear about algorithms and yeah. tech and data. And so yeah. this just feeds into that, like, Oh, the nerds are ruining baseball. See? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I was actually going to ask you if there are like any law, I think tech is kind of a big one in play, like just uh, objective uh, measurement based, player development is, is one, but like, do you think there are trends that are good for baseball and bad for baseball? Have you thought about any examples of, of either or? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that uh, tech is pretty neutral because um, I I think it can be used by the players to get better. And a lot of times, um, you know, they see that value. So they don't, they don't have that much of a negative opinion of it. You know, something like robo lumps, I think actually has a, pretty even split among players that I have to talk to, you know, and it's not just the hitters want it and the pitchers don't or whatever. It's like everybody has like a different set of reasoning where they're like, Oh, I just want to have it to be the same every night or, or this or that or whatever, or I care about catchers and I want them to have jobs based on their framing abilities. But um, no, I, I think that um, um, I think it's on MLB and the league office to change the rules of the game. If they think, that any of the things that are happening, any of the trends that are happening are not good for baseball. Yeah. So I think it's possible that fewer balls in play is not good for baseball. Cause I think about that moment where everybody's on their cell phones at the ball- ballpark and you hear sort of the crack of the bat and everyone looks up. Um, so i kind of feel like more cracks of the bat <laughs> means more looking at the game. Yeah. Um, more, and I think that's good. So yeah. I would, I would, um, I would muck around with baseball. Um, it, I think that tech and data and stuff, you can't stop it. It's a machine. It's coming. You know, everyone, if you, you talk to younger players, they're like, I talked to Bryce Jarvis, man, that guy, you know, that guy spoke advanced tech and data. Like yeah. he hadn't even played for a major league team yet. So in a major league org yet. So, um, I think that's, that's all coming. So what you have to do is look at the game and decide what rules you need to change. Do we need to move the mound back? Do we need to, you know, do we need to move the fences? Do we need to uh, make fundamental changes? You know, somebody was even talking about like making the base pass 88 feet, make them 87 feet. Yeah. You know, like there's all these, like, it's a game. You know, I just was playing a game with my kids and they were like, Oh, I don't like this part of this rule and we we created the game yeah exactly and we were, i was like yeah man change the rules yeah change the rules if you don't like the way it, it makes the game go change the rules yeah. could completely so, change the meta um, kind of thing what do you think the best way is to figure out like uh what rules should be implemented and and who it like like if it's the viewers that they're we're trying to benefit do you think there's a good way of like figuring out what kinds of rule changes we should uh do or should it always mm. be like um just be like the Manfred mm. or, or whoever should just like make a rule and uh, make it happen. And, and hopefully it'll, his perspective will be, be the right one for uh, the, the viewers. Mm. That I had not considered very good question. I like that. I hadn't considered it because I didn't think it was possible, but it, I think it is possible, especially now with all these affiliated leagues, um, mm-hmm. they kind of almost just like took independent ball and like, made it another part of the MLB umbrella. I saw some like drawing where like independent ball was like in the major league umbrella. And I was like, what? that's like, it's independent anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but really like he made the, he made these deals with like the Atlantic league and stuff. Right. Yeah. So you could just try and make different deals and be like, okay, Atlantic league, you're doing mm-hmm. robots. You're not, you're, you're going to change the mound. You're not. 
Um, I one thing I don't have is the confidence that they would take a scientific approach to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. I yeah. like like when you saw the Atlantic League, right? They made like 50 changes to the Atlantic League. It wasn't just robo arms. Yeah. I would have been more like introduce one thing and be like, yeah. okay, we're doing robo arms and nothing yeah. else. And then see time. what happens, right? And then yeah. in this other league, we're doing you can steal first base and nothing else, you know? In this other league, we're doing 88 bass base pass and nothing else. And they could do that at this point. They have enough leagues. Um, but if it's the minor leagues, then you're kind of, as a kid coming up, you'd be like, ah, oh, damn it. They're sending me to the league with the different mound or they're sending, you know, like it could get yeah. really dirty, really yeah. fast. But I think what I would do instead is just make one small change every year mm-hmm. and, uh, and reevaluate year. after that year. Yeah. You get a whole year to see what it did because there are always unintended consequences, man. There's always like, if you do change the mound, what if injuries shoot up or, you know, people just try harder to throw hard. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you, um, or what, what if like command goes like nuts because they have to like command it like a foot further than they're used to or whatever it is, you know? So, right. um, I would just make s- small changes year over year. I think the NBA is actually okay at this. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 uh, the NBA like makes a lot of changes. Yeah. Really? Well, I mean, yeah, like I so they, the NBA is like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they made this whole big deal. Like you couldn't, at the beginning, it was like, you couldn't, you couldn't hand check the guy on the perimeter anymore. Right. Oh yeah. And so we had this explosion of three points, you know, and like, and, and guard play. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they were like, you know, they've actually started going back the other way where they're doing, they're trying to look at rip throughs and, and, you know, maybe we'll only have two foul shots on a three point foul. You know, mm-hmm. so that we don't just have like James Harden sitting by the top of the key trying to like get a foul on on a, th- yeah. on a yeah. three pointer. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I was gonna say one one thing the NBA did uh, kind of like sped past MLB on, and, and I think MLB is trying to catch up on it now is um, like kinematics and movement because they 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 implemented they that sports to, really? vision. Yeah, they implemented that sports vision yeah. tracking a couple years ago, and I mean MLB got Hawkeye this year, but it's probably gonna be a while until that data is both like clean and reliable and people like public people are able to use it and everything. Whereas like sports vision cameras have been in a, in, in, in a NBA courts, I think for, for a couple of years and, and people are already like doing really cool stuff with it. We have like one of, uh, I, th- I think you've worked with, uh, maybe you haven't, but Kirk Goldsberry, who's like famous for his uh, shot, shot tracking charts and everything. Like uh, we, we don't have like, you know, like that, that kind of stuff sped to the forefront of NBA analytics much quicker than really, like movement uh, based stuff has, has a, uh, has been to the forefront of MLB. Yeah, I yeah, know. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, they had to a little bit more in baseball cause we're so static or so like, you know, one, it's like book. baseball is like also, but baseball is like one on one, right? Yeah. yeah. One on one. What was the, you know, what's the score? What's the count, you know, throw a pitch. What's the score? What's the count? Yeah. You know, with them, like all running around the court, you, they had to get to that sort of analysis way faster than baseball. But yeah, um, I mean, like y'all know, know this a little bit more than I do, probably. I mean, like biomechanics, uh, it, you know, is taking a big like I've seen y'all's like sort of skeletons, you know, throwing baseballs. And I think of like uh, Wake Forest and, mm. and their lab. Um, and the, the problem, I guess, is that there's just like probably like five places that are all set up to like not only capture all the information, but then do something interesting with it. Yeah, um, and then implement that in the training process. So do you think I have the? Am I, is my number way off? Too yeah. too low I, or too high? I'd say that's I'd say that's pretty good as far as like a like a private place, like not necessarily associated with the team. Um, it might even actually be more than that if you just looked at like universities that have access to mm-hmm. a biomechanics lab on campus, and then they're starting to like implement or pros, dabble and, and kind and of pros a thing. Are starting to play there too, right? Yeah, like pros are starting like Vandy people, like especially anybody who graduated there and he goes back and trains there. Exactly. Yeah. So there's actually, I'd say the, I mean, the number of biomechanics labs at universities with a baseball team is like easily into the hundreds. Um, Um, you know, like you can find those. I mean, even at, uh, even at UPS where I went like a small D three, like we have a biomechanics lab. Now it's just about like the coach kind of seeing baseball biomechanics being popularized, noticing that they have a lab in their exercise science department and then trying to connect with, you know, the, the professor recruiting. And- right. 
but the but the problem there is the last piece you mentioned in your question is probably like not really that existent in terms of like actually doing something with it, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> you've got a lot of these like super smart professors that run the biomechanics lab uh, and they understand kinematics and joint angles for like gait and running, maybe like stair ambulation, stuff like that. But you show them a pitching motion. I mean, they're just, you know, like it, it, especially, you know, uh, typical biomechanists, they'll use like joint kinetics, uh, you know, like torques and moments as to try and quantify like stress so if they build a model purely off that it's just going to be the old like you know don't throw hard kind of a thing uh because they're just going to mm-hmm. look at like torque is like more torque is bad that's torque more stress less do less kind of a thing so the, i i think a lot of instances uh when that like first interaction starts to happen um, it's just not that actionable or it's actionable in like the wrong direction you know kind of a thing <laughs> it should be worse no, no I, I was gonna say I, I, Oh, go ahead. No, you you go. Oh, I was just going to say really quickly to, to kind of just build off that. I remember in uh, 2018 winter meetings when myself, Bodie, Mike Rathwell, and uh, Sam, Sam Breen and Jason Oshart, we met with a bunch of teams. And one of the main things we were pitching is our biomech, like our biomech insights. Because we at that point, we already had a year or two backlog of data mm-hmm. and models and conditional text notes and all this stuff. And a lot of teams... I think it's typical of sports teams in general, but a lot of teams were kind of skeptical to hop on because they want to do it themselves. But like mm-hmm. what they didn't really account, I mean, maybe they did account for and we're just that cocky, but it's it's not about just building it yourself, which takes some time and effort, but also about having those ears of like data stored. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you, you have someone oh, yeah. go through a biomech lab and then you get the kinematics and connects spat out. Like, what are you going to do off it? We have, we have years of data. We have elite throwers classified in a specific biomech bucket. Uh, we have an idea of like what that motion looks like at the separate playing levels. Yeah, that's going to take you years to to build. So it's it's yeah, you know like they, they start as a run. Yeah, how many college kids are you going to be able to run through your your lab? Like yeah, we, yeah. we had that. You yeah. know, and yeah. then also how many like how many years of mistakes is it going to take? Right, yep. like y'all made mistakes. Y'all learned stuff. Y'all like you know the, there was. You know, there were the very early stick figures. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 for sure. This oh, is yeah. the we're on the fifth version of our of our like processing pipeline in, in uh, kinematic analysis. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The other yeah, thing so too each, with the each uh, time, like you, like the players tell you something, or the research tells you something, or you try to implement something. Like yeah. I heard some story about um, you know uh, a certain AGM like wanting to um, you know if you guys make if like. It, if you take your turns on the base pass at like this exact, you know, this, you know, if you guys push it a little bit harder here and here and you run through these cones, like we'll score like five more runs a year or 10 more runs a year. That could be a win. Uh, so like came to spring and like put the cones out and every player was like, dude, it is not possible. <laughs> Did you did you stop to think that if it was possible for me to run in this format, like yeah. the reason we've been running this way is because that's how it's possible. Yeah. That little path you've made for us? Yeah. No. And the first person who like has like a three week injury, you're it's on your ass, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, the other you thing probably had something like that where you're like, uh, this is the best way to go. And exactly. Then, like bodies were like, no, this this yeah. ain't possible. This ain't work. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other thing too with uh, specific to like colleges and, you know, pro teams specifically is they can get caught in the trap of their own data being like local minima and maxima within their organization, right? So like Mm -hmm. if they're only collecting data within that team or that school population whatever's being taught if it's being taught the bottom a scouting bias yeah yeah been, that's they're, they're that's what you're going to see they have a scouting bias they have a, yep. a teaching bias yeah exactly so you're going to bring those guys in you're going to train them a certain way and then you're going to say well all of our best guys do this right but you don't mm-hmm. know uh what's going on in other other organ teams and we've seen that in our like when we've gone and done mobile assessments with uh whether it's like schools or teams I mean, it is especially the case when we went over to Japan, but it was like the the underlying signal was a very different type of thrower, you know, place to place. Like there were things that stuck out uh, kinematically that just differed between like region, you know, teams. So, mm. so I think that's a, a problem that uh, teams could run into, which as far as places that have access to a diverse amount of data, it's going to be like, 
our lab, the Wake Forest lab, anyone who yeah. can just like invite anyone to come in and get assessed kind of a thing. And I think t- yeah. teams are always going to run into that issue. I guess Hawkeye could potentially change that, right? If you get some, um, you know. All of a sudden you got everybody. Exactly. Yeah. As long as it's like majors, accurate majors. and reliable and it, and it works. But um, that, I think that'll be the potential game changer there for, for pro teams. No, I, a couple of things uh, occurred to me. Um, uh, I, I just spoke to the Wake Forest Analytics kids, um, and uh, one of the biomech uh, ones like was like, "Yeah, I'm a little different than the other people in this class, um, but like, does anything stand out in terms of like present and future biomechanical analysis and like you know what what could be done?" And like, I didn't say it in these words then, but afterwards, I was thinking about it this way, like. Um, the 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 thing you train your data against is so important. So you you made that the comment about torque, right? Right. So I, I feel like mo- like a lot of biomechanical modern analysis, the two outputs that are being trained are against are torque or stress and velocity. Yep. Right. And and it's almost being treated as like those are the one is the positive, one is the negative, and we're just trying to find the right balance. Yeah. But there are there is at least one other big thing that you could study command. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and I think that the fact that command is dirtier in terms of uh, the stat, the numbers, the data, you know, command stats are not as far along and like, you know, it requires some knowledge of the pitcher's intent. It's like mm-hmm. not an easy concept to, yeah. to do in data makes it like people put it away. Yeah. But the more they put it away and the more they just focus on on velocity and, and, and torque, like that means that there's an opportunity. And that that's something I'm I'm thinking about it right now. I'm trying to write this piece about it has to do with Hegel and philosophy and stuff, but mm-hmm. really the idea is that once there's some sort of accepted uh idea that we've we accept as a as a culture, then almost by necessity uh, another another sort of avenue opens up. And so one thing I wanted to ask you guys was like, you know, um, so if we accept pitch design basically in baseball and every team accepts it and every team has like a a very similar playbook at some point. And I've seen, I just looked at the numbers and like all breaking walls have like an inch more drop of just last last four years Mm -hmm. where it's like, people are like, Oh, drop is good. You know, let's, let's, let's coach for drop. Let's look for it. Let's get it. Um, doesn't like after a while, like if everyone's throwing the same sliders, then it's, you know, then, right. then there's gotta be someone with like the Elysier Hernandez thing, whatever that thing is. Have you ever seen this? Mm-mm. Do you guys know about Elysier Hernandez? I don't think so, no. uh, imagine he, he throws 94, right? Imagine an 83 mile an hour cutter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen it on high schoolers. I've seen yeah, that, I've yeah. seen that cutter on high schoolers. But did they have a 94 yeah. mile an hour fastball? No. Yeah. 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 That much of a drop? Yeah. What? Yeah. It has no drop. It has a little bit of sweep. And he throws 94. And I think most people are like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, like, when I look at it, I'm like, this can't work. And yeah. then I look at the, and it has like a 25% whiff rate. And you're like, what? Yeah. So that's my point is like, you know, at some point, just being different will matter. Yeah. But, one thing that I don't have a sense of is like how many how many organizations do you think like walk through your your doors like how many how many organizations in Major League Baseball? Well, know? so if we probably in terms of players, probably in terms of players, yeah. I, I imagine we've we've probably assessed or trained a player from from each team. At yeah, some that's point. what I was gonna say. Would, yeah. So well, as far as like players walking in, yeah, completely different in terms of like some teams send dozens of players, some teams like send players multiple times. They, they agree to send them multiple times a year. Yeah. Uh, so we're some, not at that point now where like everyone's doing pitch design. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, I mean, there are probably players from teams that, you know, trained here and those teams don't know that kind of a thing. As far as like right. teams yeah. actively sending players, uh, maybe like a third to half, actually probably more than that. Close to half to two thirds is probably closer. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's an open question. It's like, what happens if yeah. everyone pitch designs and like, yeah. then at some point, because even the way stuff is des- defined, like yeah. the, one of the metrics you guys train against, like mm-hmm. you guys like correct your work with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The way it's defined is, is based on every 
like the norm, like yeah. the means, you yeah. know? <laughs> so yeah. like if the means all change, does it, yeah. does it just mean yeah. you have to keep pushing it and get more drop and more drop or like, will there be an Elysia Hernandez where you're like, yeah. Um, yeah. no, all of a sudden now we need less drop. Yeah. That, I, we talk <laughs> that, that actually gets into like something else too with that though. Like, uh, cause I mean, a missing piece of that is like, and we, I think we've talked about this before is like the kinematics piece matters. Like the biomechanics piece matters in pitch design. And we probably haven't like nearly accounted for that. Uh, connect, you know, nearly enough, those two. right? Like, because if, if you think that yes, pitch design is a thing and there is like a trend towards ideal pitches that everyone is like searching for, some of those pitches aren't kinematically possible for yeah. like certain types of throwers, right? Like if you went up no, to- I tried to create a new pitch and it was the like overhand- Yeah. Like, Cole Mentor. Exactly. threw it at, the, at yeah. the drive line, but like he only could do it because he <laughs> used to throw from the like super high yep. arm slot, you know? Yeah. I mean, even the yeah. same arm slot, the way that the arm deploys can be different from the exact same arm slot, right? Like Trevor Bauer has a very distinct, like the way that his arm deploys kinematically, which allows him to release- like at certain axes at certain like spin efficiencies that other pitchers might not be able to do from that same exact slot. So it's beyond slides. It's also like how they move. And that's kind of like probably a missed piece. So if you do assume that, then you might be trying to like teach a pitch to a person that they like physically can't execute can't or like never will be able I, to, you know, I just saw something today, the baseball cloud R guys. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them uh, just had a thing about just like correlations with extension. Yeah. And one thing that was really interesting was that he said uh, something about uh, the relationship of extension on fastballs to breaking balls. And like um, there was a negative correlation. Oh man, mm. it was pretty good. I, um, but it, 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 what, what was interesting about it was like immediately in my head, it popped, the rays popped. Because the Rays always lead the league in extension, yeah, and you know they throw they throw you know high in the zone and they try to like increase um, spin uh, spin efficiency, yeah. And I wonder if there is something there where they just like, you know, I don't think of a lot of great changeups, mm -hmm. you know, when I think of the Rays. So maybe they just found out that like people with great extension on their yeah. fastball can throw breaking balls really well. And so we're just going to combine those two things and that works for us. So yeah. We, yeah. we talk, we talk a lot about uh, just kind of like being different, like to be good is to be, to have good stuff, but also just be different than the, than the, than the norm. And I think uh -huh. about it in terms of gaze tracking and, and like, we're trying to break into that kind of side of research and just vision and perception and what a hitter, what makes it hard for, or what makes a hitter, good at perceiving a, a pitch and predicting where a pitch is going to be to make good contact. And I think that like a lot of the research going back to what Anthony did in 2017 with the EEG headset and then just like um, general neuroscience f uh, research and then some of the preliminary gaze track and stuff that we did, it's just like you develop these patterns and if somebody doesn't fall into that pattern, then like he's, they're going to be hard to hit. So like if you focus yeah. on just being different, like paying attention to the mean, like you said, the mean's going to be changing, whatever, as, as people start to adopt new processes. I think that like, if you do a good enough job of prioritizing being different mm -hmm. from the other people, then it's your like propensity to be successful is probably pretty, pretty great. Yeah. Um, I think for the, for the pretty long term. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, like when you think of a, um, when you think of a, uh, a, like a veteran pitcher that is spot, that, that you would like, I kind of, I, I think of Greg Granky. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was thinking of Granky too. Yeah. Yeah. You were thinking of Granky? Yeah. 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 I mean, he just started throwing a slow curveball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just like, <laughs> screw it. So funny. Just I'm to make throw this like losing. 64 mile an hour yeah. because my, because my fastball is now 88. You know? yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. this curveball is like suddenly much more usable. I'm gonna, just going to go moir it. I'm yeah. going to go slow, slow, <laughs> slower. Yeah. He's so funny. But yeah, like, no, yeah. Being different. You know, I also think of like use Mero Petite and stuff with like release point, release action. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think what that's, a, think that's a really, I'm going to quote you if you don't mind. I mean, it's, we're, in, we're on the record here. I think you're going to fit right into my Hegel piece. I think one of the things is not only, like, I think on my conclusion, I, you know, a lot of times I write these things in my head before I ever put pen down. And my conclusion is like, 
not only be better, but be different. Oh yeah. You know, like, yeah. hundred percent. Gotta be part of it. Yeah. Like, it's gotta be both. You can't like, uh, I guess the Grinky is, is like maybe a argument against this, but you got to have good stuff, but also it has to be stuff that's, that's different. So like, if you have bad yeah, stuff, because you, it's probably easy to hit. There are so. probably some, there are there some universal like truths that seem to come out of the biomechanical data for y'all? Like, I mean, you know, Oop. certain it's huh? it like the it's moving fast. Yeah, exactly. Throwing, throwing the ball harder, like certain segments, rotating. uh, rotating quickly, but like a lot of yeah. staples that we think are staples, eventually we find an outlier that does it differently. Kind of a thing. Yeah. Like, like we'll a chunk of outliers. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll be so hard set on like, uh, looking at one piece of the data set and it's like, oh yeah, this is, I mean, you have to have your trunk angle at this point at foot plant kind of a thing. And then just someone comes in and throws harder than the entire data set without doing that, <laughs> you know? And it's just like, okay, ultimate- well, you can find a way to do it with like that movement pattern kind of a thing. And like, I mean, I think about that a lot as like elite throwers, the more and more mm-hmm. that we've seen, uh, we, we think of them as like elite uh, athletes, but, and, and the way that they move, I think of them sometimes as just like elite problem solvers within like the context mm. of their body. So like h- however they're built was like broad shoulders, tall, lanky arms, whatever it is kind of a thing. Like they just have that like proprioceptive athletic ability to solve the problem that is the context of their body. And that's just like throw hard with my body. And so right. because of that, like they've been able to find ways to throw that still just like, break our models like no matter where we go i mean this like definitely happened when we started to bring in more pro guys uh for the assessments it happened when we went to the dominican it happened when we went to japan like every time we've gone somewhere else it's like uh, we've never seen this before like technically we would run this person through our assessment and it's like a million red flags but he just hit 94 for a strike so like He's probably doing it fine, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. I, I have a feeling that, like, Japan would have been, like, a real eye-opening experience. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It's like, no, you can't do it this way, but you yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Every, every, time, every time that happens, it's really exciting as well because every, like, every time it breaks, every time we find an outlier, uh, outlier and then maybe we look for more people like that and like, mm-hmm. oh, well, these people kind of move pretty similar. This is another way to do it. Yeah, and then that just like improves our long term like categorization type process um, to just like better prescribe better like training or or approaches or whatever. So because you can better be like you know okay you fit into one of these classes that you know we yeah. didn't even know these classes were different before, yep. but now now we're like oh okay there's three or four ways to do this and your body sort of fits you know your your patterns fit this so let's we're just going to move you it's more like it's like uh, on pitch design too it's not like hey go out there and throw randy johnson's slider yeah. it's like hey move your slider is on way. your slider's on this contour and i think you know it could be a little better if you just did like moved it to this contour and like, we're just talking about you know an inch or two of drop or an inch or two yeah. of sweep and yeah i'm mm-hmm. trying to like tell everyone to throw randy johnson's slider yeah i think you know, what, what do you think of uh seam shifted wake pitches and, and and the research kind of behind that which is pretty new and i think a lot of people i mean we're definitely believers and we've run a we we, we put out a, a blog pretty recently talking about seam shifted wake and how that makes like certain sinkers more effective and how to identify them and i know baseball prospectus did a big piece with harry pavlidis and alan nathan and barn smith obviously uh mm-hmm. like what are your thoughts on that and and also what what does kind of the industry think about that since almost in a certain way it's a new physics component to something that otherwise has already been you know has had like decades of research behind it you know i think it's really exciting because i just talked about how sometimes moving contours in terms of making a better pitch you're talking about an inch or two and by all evidence, um, seam shifted wake effects can be on the on the on the order of three to four inches. You know, there's there's there seems to be a lot of movement in there. And um, I'm not I'm not so certain that I understand um, the physics of it. Like uh, it seems like almost like a duh to me would be like, oh, yeah, the 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 the, the seams mean a lot. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but uh, I think with Hawkeye, we're really going to be able to um, 
uh, demonstrate this best and we're already doing it. So I almost feel like, you know, maybe some teams either knew about this or maybe just um, it was like a, a scouting thing in the past. I mean, a lot of the seam shifted weight pitches, there's a lot of like, you know, uh, of top pitchers like Strasburg and Scherzer, you know, their changeups seem to be seam shifted wake situations. And uh, maybe the way that like a guy like Ian Happ um, or Spencer Tur- Turnbull can have uh, such different movement patterns on his four and two seam and th- thereby have like really effective two fastballs where mm-hmm. everybody else is just sort of picking one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that like we saw this stuff and we didn't understand it. And now we have a way to understand it. Yeah. So I think I, I it'll be, quick. I think it'll be accepted uh, fairly quickly, and and whoever can sort of manipulate it uh, is going to win from it. Yeah, I was going to say I have a quick, I have a quick last add-on on that, possibly inflammatory question. But did you or people you know have trouble initially accessing Hawkeye data, or or having it, having it be kind of open sourced by the league? And and, and well, if it's too inflammatory, feel free to hit me for no comment. But uh, no, 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 no. I, I mean, yeah. I wrote I wrote yeah. about how uh, they were using two iPhone cameras in center field to try and uh, uh, try and get uh, the spin the, the observed spin rate, so the spin axis. So um, I think they made some mistakes in the implementation. From what I gather, I cannot necessarily write this down in print, but I can talk about it. Is that uh, maybe there had been um, a sort of like uh, this is a, a proof of concept. Um, and then that was sort of made into the thing. Mm. Whereas even Hawkeye might've been like, that, that was a proof of concept. What we really, we would really like spend more money and have better tech, you know, but you know how MLB does stuff. They're always just like, yeah, no, no, that, you're doing it the right number. You're doing it cheap. So we like it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that they could have had better hardware in there. Um, you know, even just putting like a rap soto out of there, uh, out there in center field, you know, in some ways would have, uh, been stronger, you know, in terms of the, the camera that the, is in the rap soto versus the camera that's in Hawkeye. Um, but I, you can play where, around with it as I understand with, uh, sort of technological approaches where you sample a smaller area of the, of the field, um, of the, of the video field so that you basically increase your frame rate by throwing away a lot of information. Yeah. Um, so I think that they'll be okay. But in terms of uh, the public, I think I think the public is searching for the ability to, to, to access this data. I know where it is, uh, but it's not in, like, it's not just coming off of Savant. Like it's, right. I, I forget what, what's the nickname for it. There's like the, there's like the other download, like the Stats API. Yeah, but then there's like a nickname for the stuff that's like a little bit more uh, that hasn't been sort of approved for Savant yet. Like there's, there's like a oh, really? uh, anyway. Yeah, I don't know some 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 of the, some some of these like sort of semi public semi mm, yeah. uh, uh, people have like the team contracts, so they have access to other information. Yeah, yeah right. Like if you if you consult with a team, like there's another right. sort of API, and there's nicknames I think for the different levels of APIs. Anyway. Me as an idiot uh, cannot find uh, observed spin axis. Yeah. When I go and look for spin axis, it's the old uh, inferred spin axis, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and that is useless to me. So uh, that's been part of why I haven't necessarily written about it. And the other part is it's pretty, pretty high level, and I'm not sure it's uh, all the clicks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I am very interested in it, and I'm looking for like a moment. I did interview Max Scherzer about his changeup. Aha! Uh-huh. I got a text. Gumbo. Oh, that's what it's called. Gumbo. Yeah. There's like pre and post gumbo. Anyway, that's that's uh, that's like one of the APIs. And oh. if you work with a team, you get access to certain levels. And um, anyway, you know, it's it's like closer to the raw data feed. You know, the closer yeah, yeah. you get, yeah. you know, right. the closer you get to just you know good the, stuff. the lovely stuff. You know, the yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I do know uh, from um, inside that um, observed spin access is is going to be rolled out soon. Interesting. Um, that's so uh, that's, yeah, it's fun. And I don't know uh, what it'll uh, look like. And, you know, but it just, just being able to download Observe Spin Access in Savant 
would be uh, make it easier for me to write this Scherzer piece. Of course, Scherzer has no idea about Seems to <laughs> Wake, and he didn't care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he found his change up uh, during long toss. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it still might be, especially if I can get, like, I can't get Strasburg, but he's very hard. But, you know, if I could get another player or two and, like, kind of uh, do one of those, like, player roundtables yeah. and, like, underlying all this is like the seems to wait conversation that's yeah that's my style and i do like those pieces those are it's really fun because you get the player's perspective and yeah. you know how can how can i and it, i think it, i speak to coaches a lot I, that's that's the type of that's the that's why i'm almost imagine i'm writing to a lot because it's like how can i as a coach interact with this person who cares not about seam shifted wake and you know what causes movement on his pitch and like how can i have this knowledge and yet still interact and still maybe give him just enough so he understands why we're doing this and still interact with him as a human being and have a good uh, rapport and yeah. and do the best things for this player so yeah you know that's why i look forward to hopefully being in the clubhouse this year and asking some players about seam shifted wake and if they care or not yeah. Yeah. The, the, know, uh, the, the seam shifted wake stuff it's really interesting but one piece i've always thought about with it because i remember back in like 2016 or 2017 when the first couple of driveline articles i think came out about it um and they were talking about it like i remember trying to mess around with it in college and like looking at the science and stuff of it it almost seems though like it's something that you won't really be able to replicate in high school or college simply because of how scuffed up the balls get like it's almost like a pitch mm -hmm. that can like mm -hmm. only happen when it's like a perfect pearl you know and at the rate that they like exchange mm -hmm. balls in the bigs they can like every change up they throw can be with a perfect ball but I always thought like you but know it's still it's in the yeah. in the games I'm just throwing a scuffed it's, it's, up ball yeah, that's gonna like tweak good. it kind of kind of a thing a twelve you know? year old like yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know I don't know, just I don't know. Looper. Yeah, yeah here try try to throw in this looper um but uh it's still very exciting for uh the major leagues though right oh yeah because yeah that's what i'm saying major yeah. league organization because they're like they're like and it's like it, it's it kind of redemption for me uh a little bit because i've always been a grips guy right yep and so now and and there's there's you know over time i've been like oh maybe grips are like not that important and like you know they're maybe they're like the, this is the last thing that falls into place now i'm like yeah. well they are the last thing that falls into place, but they can make like a three inch difference sometimes. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and that's, that's worth chasing. But yeah. I remember I tried to define deception once by taking arm slot and just like relating arm slot to movement. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was like pre spin rate days, but I feel like you could do the same right now where you just take arm slot velocity, spin rate, spin axis. Um, and like, line it all up and predict movement and then look at the outliers that yeah. have different movement. I, I just, I called that deception back in the day. Um, that is a form of deception, but I think yeah. that's the shifted weight. You yeah. Know, deception. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. I, yeah. I guess I've always just, I like, uh, I'm just imagining like some college kid who, if he had a major league ball every time, it would be like a seam shifted wake fastball, but instead it's just like a straight two seam, you know? And he'd like, yeah, that was well, always, that I was mean, my you thing for scouting. Yeah. Then you can use it for scouting. That's like, what I'm saying. You know, has the right this guy's good baseballs. And, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that my fastball that I threw in college, it was a seam shifted wake fastball. I just never had a good enough ball, you know? So like, <laughs> yeah. my ERA, like is probably two or three points <laughs> down with a clean ball every time. You know, speaking of being a grips guy, Kevin, you want to tell him about the uh, the new grip from from the analytics wing meeting? Oh yeah, like <laughs> dude, uh, did you put? I think I think either this year or last year, you put you tweeted out like a middle finger grip uh, <laughs> as a as an April Fools. As an and April one of our Fools. analysts, man, dude, one of our analysts in a in a meeting last Monday. Put it on a slideshow because he, he he's doing some work with uh, cataloging grips because we're cataloging grips for our, our edutronic guys like people uh, <laughs> throw on edutronic and we have the edutronic data we have the rap sort of data whatever and and he put the that grip that that like a picture of that grip and we're just like it was me me Eric Jagers and ironically like this is an yeah, actual grip? ironically yeah and, and I remember <laughs> Jagers was asking him he's like who, who, whose grip is that and then he said like whatever Giants player y y you mentioned and Jagers kind of made up. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jager's like, I don't see that anywhere. And we like move on in the meeting. 
And then like five <laughs> minutes later, Jager's is like, dude, that was an April Fool's. <laughs> Dude, I fell I fell out of my chair laughing. I fell out of my chair laughing. I, I, I gotta find a clip and post it on Twitter. I fell out of my chair laughing when he, Dan, when he said Dan that. fucking lost it. It was so funny. Yeah. So funny. Oh my god, that's um that's uh you know it's funny too because well I don't tell that part, but uh uh that's Jeff Samarja. Oh wow. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah, so yeah, he's was... actual grip. No, yeah, no. yeah, that's his actual grip. <laughs> I, just, I told him the gag, gag I was going for, and he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah. fuck yeah!" Here's the here's the one seamer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damn. That's, that's awesome. Oh, my God. That's I, I I could see him being like um, uh, terrible to work with because he he's always yelling at me about analytics and being dumb or whatever. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but sometimes if I ever think about like, could I like help a team? I think of Jeff Samarja because man, we had like seriously normal interactions, like good interactions, mm. stuff that ended up being good for my pieces. Uh, I don't think that I made necessarily made an effect on him, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, we definitely connected and we talked a lot of ball. And uh, he was very, I thought he was very smart about his craft. And even if he didn't love analytics, um, we we had a lot of ways to connect. So yeah, uh, I learned a lot from from talking to him. The shark, baby. All right. We have a question in the chat. Um, is, do you have an idea uh, that MLB should implement that hasn't been thrown around uh, too much in public or, or like in private that you've talked about? Like, do you have any like rule changes or ideas that uh, should change going forward? Mm. Um, I've seen some stuff about stealing first and making the, I, I mentioned them earlier, but stealing first and making the, the base pass shorter. Um I think it'd be it, it might be fun to like uh, find a way to promote speed hmm. um and uh both of those uh would incentivize more base stealing and and speedy players um i don't necessarily want a league full of magnaria sierras though yeah um so but i think you know the homer will still be the best thing you can do so even if you got a couple guys stealing first or stealing more bases. Um, I don't think that uh, those changes would uh, just eradicate baseball as we know it. So it's kind of um, interesting because uh, softball and that that's kind of a thing in softball, right? Like putting the ball on the ground in softball isn't um, isn't like necessarily a bad thing because like if you're fast and if you're lefty, like you can just slap the and, defense and, isn't as good and yeah, yeah, and you you can just like make it. You just like have a good average and be successful uh, putting the ball in play, even if it's if it's on the ground. That's kind so. of that's kind of what I did. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. I just waited, and it was so funny because in order to go the other way in softball, you had to be like, you had to be like, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then you sit hit on out the middle, and you're like, oh man, that was hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know, I remember you, uh, you ripping, like, I think you put out an article a couple of years ago when you were, uh, tr like checking your bass speed on Zep, I think it was. And you, 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 ha you were in the mid sixties. Is, is that right? Yeah. But, um, have you tried on blast? I did. I hit in front of Trackman um, at Cal. Oh, oh nice. And, um, it was, so this is, this is the most embarrassing part of the story. My, my, my dude is, uh, Noah Jackson, he, he's one of the coaches there. And so he goes up into the booth to, to run the, the track man. Um, and, and Andrew Vaughn's dad is throwing, uh, is throwing VP to me. Mm. Um, and I'm standing up there with a wood bat because I want to, I want to like kind of approximate the major league situation here. Um, uh, I have not, uh, hit off of a live VP, like, I don't know, maybe since high school. <laughs> so I, I'm like super nervous. I get up there. I, uh, I had been doing some Eric Cressy exercises and stuff. Nice. I've been trying to like <laughs> improve my rotation. And I, I knew from the K vest that my, I had minus minus pelvis. So I've been doing some like nice. pelvis exercises and like really, and I had the thought, my swing thought was like whip that pelvis around, you know? Yeah. And so I had a good swing thought and I was doing everything and I hit the first one and my friend up in the booth goes, 48. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, no you don't way. have to yell it down. Yeah. Man. No and way. then I, 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 I hit another one. He's like, 52. <laughs> I was like, oh 
my god, it's so embarrassing. And now all of the the kids in Cal are like looking over and they're like, "What's happening over there?" And yeah, I'm like, yeah. No, shut up, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I really got a hold of one. Oh man, it felt so good. It went right over like a major league shortstop would have caught it without maybe a jump, but probably not. Yeah. <laughs> but it fifty eight over the shortstop's head. Wow. 58 i'm like fuck you <laughs> next pitch andrew von's dad throws me a pitch um and then my friend noah yells out you broke your bat <laughs> <laughs> and i and i look back and andrew von's dad is already sitting down like he knew i broke my bat the second i made contact oh, and he wow. was so disgusted with me Wow. His son off. is Andrew Vaughn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and who is this joker that wants me to throw VP to him that's hitting 48 mile an hour lasers? Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> breaking his bat. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. So, wow. uh, yeah, my hand speed's okay. Uh, I think everything else is just a train wreck. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Hell yeah. I wanted to come up when, like, I actually planned on coming up seeing the new spot i mean the covid wrecked this but i wanted to see the new spot and then maybe get another assessment uh on the k vest to see if any of my you know working Deep out had increase. changed any of my metrics you know yeah yeah you definitely definitely when things uh when things chill out um definitely need to it's it's uh looks looks awesome it's looks incredible huge yeah huge and beautiful and it's completely a, a total 180 <laughs> it's like so much <laughs> yeah. space uh, just everything. I mean, the weight room is incredible. It's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember coming in there, you know, back in the day, and like Bodie's office is tiny, and it's mm-hmm. like upstairs, and like the weight room is like right up against the throw thing. Yeah, and like yeah. I, I when I was there, I was like honestly like uh, workers comp. Like I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. gonna get hurt. We're starting a union, <laughs> drive on union. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like people doing pull downs over here, and like you know, someone yeah. else is like, I could see this going really wrong. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We had we had to make a big uh, safety video and put signs up everywhere for things like yeah. uh, throwing bats or throwing balls or whatever. You guys are legit hitting. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have to have these yeah. things up exactly. <laughs> no, you, you oh, know, if you want to hear a workers' comp man, if you want to hear a workers' comp from the old facility, and, and Lindley and I were just talking about this last week. We were on a double date, dude, and we started talking about this in front of our girlfriends. <laughs> but but uh, we used to have really bad like plumbing, and we put in like a fan because we just have all these baseball players, dude. Like mine and mine and Anthony's desk oh, was yeah. right next to the bathroom. We used to have all these baseball players, you know, working out, taking a bunch of protein shakes, going to the bathroom, just taking massive dumps. <laughs> and then it was and then so unfair. In the lobby, so we threw a fan in there. Uh, I think Bodie built one and then whatever. We we had some some guys coming in to fix the plumbing. And what ended up happening is instead of it uh airing out the lobby, it would just like all the air from the bathroom <laughs> would just air out directly directly over <laughs> in the desk. Yeah. In the yeah. main gym, dude. Yeah. So we were just feeding shit air right over in the desk. So, sat down here just like it sounded like yeah. someone just really unloaded on me. Yeah. And everyone, did, everyone, did anyone literally. blame you? They were like literally uh, no, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just keep dropping bombs. No, that actually <laughs> happened a good amount. We had one of our marketing <laughs> employees, she would come over, she'd be like, Kyle, it smells bad over here. That was a yeah. thing. I forgot yeah. about that. Not my fault. Yeah. yeah. Lindley's desk is like signs. Yeah, the so bad. Turn well is not me. Out. Yeah. <laughs> so brutal. Just walk back out. So brutal. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. God damn. You, you know we we uh we usually keep keep these. Uh, I mean your podcast might might set a PR on on time. We usually keep them pretty tight. But uh, I just I heard my stay. kids are back and I gotta I gotta start making dinner. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say last last question to to kind of. Uh, be- before you go, since you're a, you're just a connoisseur of beer and sandwiches, I was going to say not not to put you on the spot. I know you got a lot of uh, long you got you got a long list of the faves, but any any recent recommendations on on beer and sandwiches that you've made that you want to shout out on the pod? Oh man, I do not I do not uh, have anything off the top of my head. My my favorite ones are actually kind of boring, which are like um, you know, like Russian river, Pliny the elder and a BLT. That would be like, a, a sort of just a really great combo. Um, but, uh, recently, what have I, have I done anything interesting recently? No, I don't think so. Uh, the lockdowns have 
been hard. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But one thing I do like to do is like throw leftovers and like, like the, one of the things that I do often is just take leftovers and put jam on it and then mm. like cheese and like put it between two pieces of interesting bread. That's like, you go. <laughs> yeah. <my> sandwiches. Well, <laughs> what's that? a good example of some in- interesting bread that you use? Uh, I like these. Uh, um, uh, I use a Hawaiian bread a lot. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'd make just sort of like mini sliders with like cool, cool innards. Um, yeah. And uh, I do things with like cinnamon raisin bagels that gross people out. Ooh. <laughs> Hell yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Mixing some flavors. All right. Yeah. So like That's tuna melts on cinnamon raisin bagels. Oh my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is wild. <laughs> What? That's awesome. <laughs> Why not? You only live once. Damn. Hell yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, you know. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for coming yeah. on. It was great. It's good to have you. We'll uh yeah, we'll yeah, be back. Really we'll be back next week, uh Monday at four with another another app for forty five. I think we're gonna have Rob on, so that'll be that'll be a good time. Oh un- unconfirmed, unconfirmed. Oh, yeah. unconfirmed. <laughs> oh, never mind. Ignore that. The Rob Hill episode might be delayed. We'll have Rob Manfred on. We'll have Rob Manfred <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. We'll see which Rob. To, 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 to hear what he has to say about your uh, rule ideas, uh, you know. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Put him Sweet. on the spot. Sweet. Thanks for thanks for coming on. All right. All right, guys. See you, boys. Take care.